Hello and welcome to Genealogy Quick Start. I'm Shamel Jordan, your host. Today we have a fantastic show as usual, right? Um, we have our special guest with us, Paul Shop. But first we're going to talk about chattel, cattle, moving through an estate inventory. You know, we want to know about our ancestors and estate inventories are an amazing way to get into the details of your ancestor's life. And then we are going to have our special guest, Paul, is going to talk about his long twisted road to freedom. And this is about Alexander Hemsley. So let's get going with Genealogy Quick Start. How are you today? It is very nice to have you here. We are a Philly Cam show, as well as we go live on YouTube and Facebook every other Thursday. So you know what I need from you when you get on here, whether it's live or in repeat, is to know who you are and where you are. We love to know where you are. And are you a proud member of a genealogy group? Please name that group because there may be some genealogy souls that need a, co a community. So let me bring on our regular guest, my buddies. Where are they? Can I see them? Here we go first. Editor and columnist, Jim Bidler. <laughs> In the dark. <laughs> And Mr. Featured Speaker, Genealogy <laughs> Tip of the Day, <laughs> Michael John oh, Neal. Boy. Oh, boy. <laughs> the, I, the phrase, you're never going to live this down, comes to mind. Well, that's, that's, beyond that's kind my of an inside joke. And the inside joke is that all of us are going to be at this major conference, which you'll learn about. And Michael is going to be a featured speaker. <laughs> <laughs> so what's going on, guys? How you doing today? What's going uh, on in your genealogy life? I've got some timber claims I've been looking at the images of, but that's that's about it. What is a timber claim? In a nutshell, if uh, this was in the... Upper Midwest and Western parts of the U.S. after the Homestead Act, you could plant, if you planted so many trees on a piece of federal ground, you could get the, get the property. And uh, it, there was some fraud sometimes attached with that and a few other interesting historical details that were, we don't have time to go into today. But You it, mean fraud in real estate? That was happening back in the day? <laughs> Uh, well, I, I don't know. I, I'm not sure it really did happen. I don't think anything fraudulent ever happened in the U.S. until probably after the 1950s. But, you know, what do I know? <laughs> What's going on in your genealogy life, uh, Jim? Well, I w got a chance to look at the Helmershausen Familien Register, this little town in Thuringia where... As luck would have it, both Michael and I have ancestry. What? And I was, yeah, I visited this as part of my German trip uh, and decided to look at their church book, which goes back to 1559. And Did you say 1559? Is that like Charlemagne time or almost? That is like almost Christ Christopher Columbus time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and they, in this family register... Uh, they lay it all out for you, and I found five generations of the Bardorf family in them, including uh, the oldest dude uh, born around 1530. What? Yeah. Wow, that's amazing. Oh, my mm -hmm. gosh. Did you find <laughs> Michael's family, too? I wasn't looking for Michael's family. He can, <laughs> he can look, up, look for them on his own. Michael, have you been to Germany? I have not. I have not been to Germany, and I've I've played with those records a little bit, but not not as much as I need to because I have a lot more people there than Jim does. Um, yeah, I just have this one line, but yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Well, I want to go just to eat and drink like Jim was doing. I didn't think he had time for research because all of his pictures were eating and drinking. <laughs> <laughs> that explains why he had so much trouble finding people in the records on Monday morning. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's get started with this wonderful quick start that you guys came up with. This is probably one of my favorite types of records to look at because there's so much juicy information that you could just research off of for years, right? Yep. So you guys have chattel cattle moving through an estate inventory. So first, what is an estate inventory? This one, when after uh, someone died and their estate was put into probate, uh, somebody would be uh, assigned, usually the executor or the administrator, if, if, if it was somebody without a will, to run through all the personal property of the individual and assign it a value. Uh, and then this was, you know, depending... You know, if there was a will, it would be then dividing up the personal property according to what the will said, and often involving an auction. We'll get to that shortly. Holy Vendu Batman. <laughs> uh, and if it was someone who died without a will, then uh, this uh, the the financial result of what the, the, the inventory items added up to would be added to the estate for distribution according to state law. And and part of the reason for the inventory also was in in some locations, the value of the bond that the administrator, the executor would have to post would be based on the value, the appraised value of the estate. So the bond covered that value. Um, and then also so they know the estate was not wasted between the death because the inventory would have to be done relatively soon after the person died. So yes. they, there was no waste of the of the estate because heirs and creditors would be concerned about that. Fantastic. So there would be an estate inventory regardless to whether or not the ancestor had a will, just they needed to have property. And OK, fantastic. So let's get started with chattel cattle moving through an estate inventory. So step one is to choose a place in a time. Well, <laughs> yeah, because these records are going to be located in the area, usually if, where the bulk of the estate was at. So if they're, if they had real property in two counties, it would normally be administered in, in the same state. It would normally be administrated and administrated in the state state in the county where the bulk of the property was located. Uh, okay. There's always exceptions to that, but that's usually the place to the place to start is where they were living when they died. Do so if you have someone who died like in the 60s or 70s, are estate inventories available to you, or is this really just older estate inventories? These in most states, these uh, the settlement of an estate, unless there's some reason to close it, which usually there's not, these are public records. Okay. Uh, they might not be the more recent ones might not be as easy to access. But they are, um, you know, they are their public records. And there, there is there is now, I think, in most states, some sort of allowance for personal property uh, below which you don't have to do the inventory. Yeah. Uh, and this, this I know in Pennsylvania, this came in in the mid 1800s that basically for the benefit of widows, that if the, the estate was below, I believe at that point, $2,500, which was some substantial money, mm -hmm. they could just, you know, okay, goes to the widow, you know, mm -hmm. all done. Uh, so, so those type of laws uh, would uh, probably in, in a fair number of cases mean the inventory doesn't have to be done uh, today. Okay. Okay. So you have to check the law. As soon as you choose the place and the time, you should check the laws to see if it was required based off of uh, value of a state. Man, I'm learning so much from you guys. I thought I knew a little bit about estate inventories. <laughs> hey, really, all the, judge, 
all the judge is going to care about is that the bills are paid. Okay. And if it's not, you know, so if they can pay the bills without maybe selling the household goods or whatnot, you might not see a detailed listing. If you've got a house that has a lot of antiques and you've got kids that are fighting over it, then you're more like, you know, more likely to see some of those, things, especially in more recent times. Family discord always breeds extra records. Nice. We love those yeah. extra records. <laughs> <laughs> Guess what I forgot to do? We have to pause and say hi to everyone. I am so sorry. We have Paula Moen here from West Deford. How you doing, Paula? We need to figure out how we're going to get in person again. Earl Weeks from Philly Cam. How are you, Earl? Hey, Denise Payne from the Netherlands. Do they narrow boat in the Netherlands? I'm into narrow boating now. Let me know because I want to come there and narrow boat. Hello, Wayne and Grace and from down the road in Magnolia. Nice to see you. Hello, Marie Capaldi in Bucks County, PA. Any of you else out there? There's missing names. There's some people out there who did not <laughs> announce. Let us know where you are and your genealogy group. So let's get back to step two, which is after you choose a place in time, you want to locate the correct place probate court. So what does that mean? Typically the records that uh, the settlement of an estate are local county court records. Um, there's some locations where it's a town, but the most of the United States is the county court records. So you're going to want to find it's a county record in the courthouse. A court, there may be different courts at the point in time when your ancestor died. It's going to vary from one state to another. Uh, but you'll want to find the court that would have dealt with the handling of probates because that might have been a separate court from court from the courts that heard other cases. Um, and you know, for our discussion today, you're going to want to look at the, the pro whatever court handled the settlement of an estate. The name can be different from one state to another, you know, in, in certain, a lot of states it's a probate court. Today, it may be a circuit court or a district court in some places. Surrogate or state court. Surrogate court, exactly. Orphan's court. Yeah. Orphans. Even if there were no children, um, it still may be an orphan's court. So you just want to keep keep those things in mind. And these are these are on, um, I find them mostly on family search, right? Family Search did did aggressive microfilming of these records, uh, usually up and up to and including 1950, for when they did them in in the decades after that. And in most cases, these have now been digitized and are are available. Browsable, right? You're not going to put the first name, last name in and get them most of the times. You're going to have to go and look through the catalog, go to the county or city and get to the orphan's court, probate, right. et cetera, right? Okay. All right. Step three is to locate the estate records. So you guys have so many estate records. Did you guys want me to go start showing some of these? You can start while you're pulling one up. Very briefly, what a, what a person wants to keep in mind, uh, the court records that we're talking about, some of them will be in ledgers or journals. Those would be transcriptions of documents, and those would be a, a summary of, of the court action. The other documents might be in a loose uh, case file of papers as well. So when you're looking at these records, you'll want to make certain. I think this is probably from a case. I don't know. But you want to make sure you're looking at the case packet. You'll also want to make sure you're looking at, at the ledgers. There'll be some duplication, but sometimes there'll be stuff in one that is not in not in the other. I didn't yeah. look at ledgers. Okay. Thank you for that, Michael. What do we yeah, have this here? Is, this is uh, an inventory of Peter Adams uh, from Berks County, mid-19th mid century. And the... Um, yeah, the thing to underline, like Michael was saying, registers and loose papers. Um, when I started as a researcher in the 1980s, Berks County, they had every different type of estate item in a different file. So you had to go look up the account separately from the inventory, separately from, from the will, separately from orphans court petitions. Thankfully, a genealogist then, for a fairly brief time, was employed by the Register of Wills Office in Berks County, and she took all these separate things 
and put them into uh, whole estate files with all the different types of paper in one file, you know, which is, oh my goodness, so much nicer. And then, and then they were microfilmed by, by Family Search and are now digitized and available. Yeah, but not every county is this the case. You might have to do separate searches of the different types of the state records. So let's back up a, just a brief second, because what you said is so important. I've seen just a state inventories, but you're saying if you just find a state inventories, you want to keep looking until you get all of the different pieces. And sometimes I see a state packet, which I think has all of the different things in there. So the packet should. Uh, but but again, you know, you want to, as Michael was saying at the at the get go, uh, you want to you want to look at those register materials, too, to make sure that all of those have made their way into the estate file. Yikes. I got work to do. I'm going to try to stay here till four with you guys, but. <laughs> got to give Paul a chance. <laughs> what is Vendu Papers? <laughs> well, well, um, this is a fancy word for saying it's the sale list. Okay. Oh, uh, and and this is interesting to compare with the inventory because the the inventory is a couple of guys, like I say, usually the executors, uh, valuing the personal property. Well, in many cases, then this personal property goes up for auction. Uh, like if my, like Michael says, if there are uh, debts, uh, debts for the estate to be paid and whatever. Um, but sometimes just because the heirs want to cash out and they, they, they don't want to add stuff. So, <laughs> uh, so this Vendu paper lists everything that went, all, all the personal property from the estate that went up to auction, who bought it which may give you some mm. hints of the, you know, the, the fan club, the friends, associates, and neighbors of the deceased. And then it gives you the actual price they paid at the auction. And then, then you get to see, okay, what stuff were the executors right on about? What stuff did they undervalue? What things did they overvalue? And it's probably worth noting that this one is in, in uh, old German cursive script. Again, it's from from it's a Berks County estate. Uh, the inventory was in English, but then the the Vendu paper is in uh, in German. Probably because pro I would imagine the clerk knew German. Whoever exactly yeah, whoever that's exactly it. They they must have used wow. the, the German auction house. Very interesting. Okay, so that's one, and uh, I think this might be the continuation of it. Yeah, that's that's the. The major part of the the list uh, of of these these items. Uh, so, so these can just, all be this fan club here, like all of these. Yeah, people. yeah, yeah. Because 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 you know you you and you see a lot of these items went for three cents, twenty five cents. Well, people didn't travel all day to come to an auction to buy stuff like that. Right. They were from the, they were from the neighborhood. Right, right. Nice. Nice venue. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right. What do we have here, Michael? Well, this one's from, this one is in English, but it, it's not the easiest thing to read. But there, this was an inventory from uh, New Hampshire. And this one mentions that it gives some clues about their religious affiliation. It mentions a pew in the uh, floor. There are actually several pews. Uh, in the Baptist meeting house, uh, one on the main floor and then one in the gallery and another half of a pew. So if I didn't know what their their religious affiliation was, they, um, they're in the inventory of the estate. It's pretty clear they were members of this of this Baptist church in Marlboro, uh, New Hampshire in 18 in 1819. And does the position give some kind of like where the pews were, say something about your ancestors? The Possibly there were there were might almost tell how many give you a clue as how big the family was because there's two and a half two pews here. You think um, they put the kids upstairs like that was the kids' pew? That's, what, that's what that's what I would have done, but it's it's really hard to it's hard to say. But there's no indicate other than the main floor and up in the gallery. There's no clue as to where 
you know, any kind of pecking order about where they were on the main floor. But it's a clue as to their religious affiliation right there, um, right there in the inventory. I do know that notice they list the pigs right before that. So I don't know what kind of commentary that makes. Um, but there was that was a good clue. That was a good clue in that. And that's not something you very often find, to be honest with you. Um, but a that's reason why you want to read through all those all those items. Very cool. I never thought about that. I'm too busy looking for the enslaved people. I totally go past all of this. All right. Let's check out, take a look at this one. What is this, Michael? This one is one from Amherst County, Virginia, 1782. And this is slightly different from an inventory. This was, it, it is an inventory, but it's a list of, this guy had 10 children, uh, nine boys and one girl, if I remember correctly. And this is what each one got. It's a delineation of what each child got. And then uh, the first couple things are what he received before the father died, 115 acres of land. The green there, it says the above was received of the decedent in his lifetime. So that's what John got before Edward died. And then the remaining portion of that, there are uh, two enslaved people, Sally and Patty. They're all, they're all listed in the... Uh, and the inventory um, and then these are the the two that went to son son john in addition to a variety of other um, other chattel property um, the other thing you want to keep in mind this is 1782 so you're not going to see dollars and cents we really can't get into a whole discussion on the monetary system today but you know you're going to see things in british money and at some points in time you may see things in uh, yeah. Each individual state had their own respective money, so you kind of want to pay attention to the to the valuation. But this is not in dollars and cents. There's a three columns there uh, indicating it's in British British okay. currency. Well, well, it's it's yeah, it's in it's in pounds, shillings, and pence. Uh, but I'm imagining that th these were Virginia pounds, uh, just Possibly, just like yeah. Pennsylvania pounds were were used into the 1820s. You see them in some, really? some. Yep, you see them in some, in some of our accountings. Yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't because I use Wolfram Alpha to create to to calculate historical money and to see mm -hmm. what that mm -hmm. value is today. I'm totally flummoxed and don't know what I would do about Virginia pounds. It's or Pennsylvania pounds. This can be difficult to get a current value. You can't do yeah. this like you can dollar from 1890 it's just not the, the conversion is not there um well and and there's there's different weights to different types of you know you know people's incomes versus different types of personal property they have inflated and and have relative values uh, much right. different today than they and did it, 200 years ago. It, it also depends where they're living and what things were valued in that precise area. Sure. In that point, uh, sure. In that point in time, um, you know, I've, there's a cowhide there. There's two shoats. If you're familiar with what shoats are, I'm pretty certain is there, and a, a, another cow and a yearling. And sometimes you'll get your agricultural history lesson when you go through these. Yes, yeah. um, I love that. Yeah. Go through these things too. Um, this is one, uh, the, the handwriting on these can be a challenge. This one comes from Harford County, Maryland in 1795. One I'll, broken mug. One broken mug. One as a gill cup. A gill is a unit of measure, if you're familiar with, with that's not related to fish. It has <laughs> nothing to do with fish gills. It does not mean she was a fisherwoman. Um, it, you know, the, the uh, inventory is pretty dis de detailed. It mentions the chamber pot. For some reason, I thought I had to underline that. <laughs> um, a woolen cloth, all the different household goods there. A snuff bottle, which gave me a little clue about either her or her uh, husband, the predeceased her. What I thought was interesting, there's, you know, a lot of household things here, which are, are, are fun to find out. But in the green box in the bottom left-hand corner, the next of, in this case, and this was a, apparently a Maryland thing in this time period, there's the two appraisers. And typically the appraisers we're supposed to not have an interest in the estate so that we get a, a, a good reasonable approximation of the value of these things. But at this point in time, 
the next of kin had to sign, which I think is kind of a good idea. The next of kin had to sign off on the inventory, indicating everything had been inventoried. That in this case, the dot she made her mark, uh, but everything in mother's house. It doesn't say that we don't know she's her daughter, but that's a good clue that uh, there's a relationship there. She's the next of kin. Why it was Sarah and not the other daughter or the son, I don't know. The, the joke is Sarah was the oldest child and by gum, she was going to be there when they went through Ma's property. <laughs> that's, that's me being a little snarky, but uh, uh, it's hard telling. It could be that she lived closest to them too. This is one a little bit later. It's great when they're typed, but keep in mind, if you don't know why things in 1795 are not typed, right. I don't know what to tell you, but <laughs> this one is from Illinois and what it's typed it's this is an, an inventory of the real estate but it indicates he owns property out in nebraska which i was unaware of when i read through this inventory and that's underlined in red um, he had a couple other parcels in nebraska as well as what he owned in illinois but this one which i did not underline it's indicating this was a timber claim timber we, claim um, referred to a little bit earlier <laughs> Um, but this would, if, if nothing else, this would tell me I need to look in Nebraska for yes. more information about this, about how this real estate was handled. It turns out in the 19, for reasons that I'm not sure of yet, in the 1940s, they finally administered his estate in Nebraska so they could clear up the title to this real estate. Why it was not done in 1904, wow. I don't know. But there was a court case in the 1940s, I believe, where they had they finally had to settle up that uh, individual's Nebraska real estate. 40, 36 years. Probably some... Probably the land was going to be sold outside the family and the buyer wanted clear title. That's my guess as to what probably happened. The buyer's going to want good, clear title. All right. Let's go back to the vendue. This is the inventory. This is the inventory. Let's check out Peter Adams. So tell us about this, Jim. Yeah. Well, it, uh, it, it goes through the main, main, uh, items uh and you know you know we're talking household goods we're talking a large bible and Yay, his books a rifle uh, his rifle yeah you know it, it it goes through down to the the most minute things um but um you know it, it'll allow you to kind of reconstruct you know what was their family life like uh as far as what goods did they did they have at this time very cool. And sometimes in those, you can get clues as to if they have a lot of books, chances are they were literate. And the other thing which we didn't mention, I want, wanted to say here real quickly before Jim goes into all this accounting, financial, CPA stuff, is that often we can get clues as to their occupation sometimes if you look at the items in there, especially when it's a detailed mm -hmm. chattel inventory, it may suggest they were something besides a farmer, if you're seeing a lot of things that a tailor or a shoemaker or what have you might need to have uh, have on hand. Cats yep. are not usually listed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and on this page, this shows the amounts that uh, he had advanced to uh, presumably his ch well, it says children, his children um, uh, during his lifetime, and that's being deducted from their uh, from their shares of the estate. Fantastic. Boy, he he gave them all the same amount. That's to the half uh, a penny. That that reduces fighting. <laughs> <laughs> and then this is just the sign off by the uh, by the register uh, that uh, the accounting has been made. So okay, let's see. Was that it? I think that was it for them. Yes. So that's step three. You want to locate these records. And step four is to focus on the inventories for clues, which you guys talked about, religion, the occupation, occupation so yeah. fan club. Love it. Step five is to document that fan club and got a lot of research to do with all those with that vendue there. And then step six 
wash, rinse, and repeat. What does that mean? <laughs> it means if, if you see like a wash tub or a hand basin in the inventory, uh, look to see that if there was any soap listed as well. Um, <laughs> Uh, just just keep going back and looking for more things and make certain you didn't overlook any uh, any clues that you didn't leave a chamber pot lying around someplace and a tenant or anything like that because uh, we don't want to overlook things. Very true. All right. Fantastic, guys. I learned so much from you guys. Denise Payne said, wow. What did Denise say? I love what Denise said. Oops, I missed what Denise said. Pounds. She, she mentioned said, the pounds and gills, I think. She said, what a gold mine of information, including the extra information about Virginia pounds and gills. <laughs> All right, let's go through the quick start, which is for chattel cattle moving through an estate inventory. We didn't talk about the heifers in the uh, in the inventories. Step one, choose a place and time. Step two, locate the correct probate court. Step three, locate the estate records. Step four, focus on inventories for clues. Step five, document their fan club. And step six, wash, rinse, and repeat. Thank you so much. That was fun. I will see you guys at the end. All right. Thanks. <laughs> Michael, why are you still here? Because I just can't let go. <laughs> All right, let's get started for our second quick start. All right, we are ready for our second quick start. But before we do, I just want to make sure I say hi to anybody that I miss. Denise, we will talk about narrow boats. Go to Prime and look up Cruising the Cut. That's a narrow boat. Hello, Emerson from Aug Chicago. Yes, Aug Chicago. Not Aug, sorry. A A G H. SC from Chicago. They are like the number one newsletter receiving and opening group for genealogy quick start. So I apl always applaud Chicago. Hi, Jean from Collegeville. And it's time to go to our next quick start. This guy that I'm about to bring out, when I met Paul, I knew, I said, we are. I'm going to be his BFF. He might not be my BFF, but I'm going to be his BFF because he is, to me, the number one most knowledgeable person about South Jersey history. And he spends a lot of times researching African Americans and their communities in South Jersey. So I'd like you guys to all welcome my buddy, Paul Shop. Hello, Paul. Hi, Shamel. It is so nice having you here today. I would like for you, normally we ask everyone their one minute genealogy story, how they got started and how they knew they were hooked. But for you, I'd like to know, how did you get started with researching African Americans in South Jersey and researching black enclaves? And when did you know that you were hooked on this subject? Well, I started in 1992. Uh, some people collect stamps and coins and some people collect baseball cards. I collect place names. And uh, the more I looked into place names on maps and uh, place name literature, the more I found African American enclaves. And um, uh, yes, I was hooked. Um, <laughs> and and uh, today uh, I have a an ever an ever growing list of communities. I have a hundred and well, over 130 uh, um, African American enclaves in South Jersey, of which over 90 are antebellum or pre Civil War, um, and of course they played an important role in the Underground Railroad, which led me into researching the Underground Railroad, uh, which then led me to research some of the prominent names that I see in these communities, like the Still family, um, and so on and so forth. And yes, by the time I was through all that, I was hooked. <laughs> <laughs> yes, map the place names, maps. Paul is your guy. So Paul came up with a I asked him, you know, which one of his which story he really enjoyed because he has so many of them. And the one that he enjoys is his long twisted road to freedom, the story of Alexander Hemsley. So, Paul, let's go ahead and get started with this um quick start. Sure. Um so First, you say, if you're interested in researching 
African Americans during this time period, you want to find, look at the slave narratives. So um, what is what is what is it about the slave narratives that you found with Alexander? Well, right away, of course, you begin to pick up South Jersey names. Um, and uh, like many of the those who were enslaved, uh, when they became fugitives, they headed for South Jersey. And certainly uh, uh, this man did as well. Um, and, and so the slave narratives provide you with that information, that framework for reviewing exactly what his route was uh, uh, through the landscape. And so you said one of your favorite places to go is where to find some of these slave narratives? Uh, well, in this case, with Benjamin Drew's uh, slave narratives, uh, Benjamin Drew uh, interviewed uh, former fugitives up in Canada, um, and um, and and he published them in a book in uh, 1857, if I remember correctly. Um, and um, it was uh, it was a good thing that he he interviewed um, Alexander Hemsley when he did, because Alexander died in '56. Oh, so he just caught him at the tail end of his life. So, it was, and one uh, of the great. things that I thought that was so poignant that you pulled out, I'm going to show um, one of the um, yeah. what he when he talked about freedom. He said that that it was a state of liberty for the mind. Yeah. If I thought of anything beneficial for me, I should have the liberty to execute it. Yeah. And these were his words in this slave narrative. They were his words. Yeah, he was uh, quite a uh, quite a well-spoken man. Um, but uh, he escaped uh, from his uh, his so-called owner in uh, uh, 1823. At the age of 23, he was born in 1800. His owner was a man named Isaac Baggs down in Queen Anne's County, Maryland, and uh, so-called professor of religion. And was always <laughs> talking to, <laughs> his slave name was Nathan Mead, and he was always talking to Nathan about the value of religion. But, uh, of course, that quote tells you uh, what Nathan was thinking about. So after escaping, uh, he uh, traveled six mi miles, hid for the night, then traveled 33 miles and stayed with a Quaker man for, for uh, three weeks. Then he traveled to Philadelphia and then went straight over into Jersey because he felt that he wasn't safe in Philadelphia. So for two months, he stayed at um, Cooper's Creek, uh, which would have been Evans Mill, uh, right across from Haddonfield. Um, and from there, uh, one, of, one of Josiah Evans's relatives, John Evans, um, was already establishing a, um, a protective enclave out in Evesham Township. And so uh, Alexander moved out there. Uh, he was there for eight or nine years. He married, had three children. And then someone entreated him to move to Timbuktu in, uh, right near Mount Holly. And uh, uh, so he did. And at that point in October, of, he was there for about four years. And then in October of 36, he was captured. Oh, no. Uh, so someone know, came into New Jersey and took him back. Well, they captured him and uh, uh, probably through the work of a snitch. And um, uh, he was taken to trial. Uh, two men that he played with as a child uh, were there as witnesses against him. I'm sure they were paid for that. And wow. he went up against a man named Judge Haywood. And Haywood, while a, a, a judge of Burlington County, had been born in Virginia. So um, uh, Alexander described him as a uh, uh, the handle of a jug, and the handle was against him. That is Alexander. So he knew that his uh, his time was short. But his uh, abolitionist attorneys, uh, one being David Paul Brown, very, very famous abolitionist attorney from Philadelphia, uh, obtained writs of certiorari so he could kick it up to the New Jersey Supreme Court. And, um, you know, in all this time, of course, uh, Alexander's in, 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 uh, incarcerated in the county jail. Uh, so so uh, let's pause on the court part okay. and let's move on to step two, which was to look for place names. Right. And so from this, um, this slave narrative, you had all you had a lot of place names 
And so what do you do with these place names? Well, like Evan, like Evans Mills and Cooper's Creek and Timbuktu. Right. You can locate them on maps, um, you know, quite readily. Um, but it's also an, a possessing a knowledge of South Jersey history and possessing a knowledge of families. Um, it helped to understand that Josiah Evans, who had the mill um, and hid, uh, hid Alexander for two months, um, that his relative John was was out there in, in an area called Pendleton or Milford, uh, where they had established a, a, a very secretive black enclave. And I've never found any evidence of slave catchers and in, in, uh, incursions into that settlement. So that's Evans Mill in, uh, in Haddonfield. It's actually on the Cherry Hill or Delaware Township side of the line. Uh, but um, you can see there's a multitude of buildings there where it would have been very easy for Alexander to be secreted, uh, particularly yes. when anybody came around looking. Well, one thing we know about South Jersey is that those snitches got stitches sometimes, right? Oh, yeah. they did. <laughs> it didn't happen in this case. So look for the place names for those clues. And then step three is to learn about Black enclaves. And so, Paul, you know, we can learn a lot more about Black enclaves when you publish your book. When are you yeah. going to publish your book? <laughs> uh, actually, I have permission now to work on it one day a week. So, All right. Yeah, All book, right. He wants to see it published, so I'll be working on it one day a week. So what's another way to learn about black enclaves until you publish your book besides calling you all the time? <laughs> <laughs> well, there, there's, there are, there's, there's place name literature out there for most counties. Uh, Gloucester County Historical Society published theirs. Uh, Salem County published theirs. There's one for Cumberland. There's one for Camden. Although the Camden County one is a bit abbreviated. Um, and, uh, and of course there's two volumes for Burlington County. So, um, you know, you look around for the place name literature that's out there. Uh, some will list, um, uh, whether it's a, a, a black enclave, some would not mention the race. Um, you also turn to 19th century County histories. Uh, for example, the 19th century County history for Burlington County, they list Coleman town, which was another black enclave in Mount Laurel, uh, without ever mentioning the fact that it was African-American. And they, and they have the wrong name for the set, for the uh, original settler as well. So. Okay, so you look do look through place name literature to learn about Black enclaves, um, county histories. Yeah. Um, that will help you as well. Yeah, and, and yeah, mm -hmm. this is what's really important because when you look at the actual census schedules, uh, you begin to pick up um, groups of African-Americans living together because they're one right after the other on the census page. Now, in this case, this is the schedule for, uh, this is 1830, and it does list Alexander Hemsley, um, lists him as Alexander Elmsley, but it's the same man. Um, How come there's no ticks on this line? Uh, because it moves over to the second page, which records all of the African-American residents. So you always have to make sure you look at page A and B in these early census records in order to understand uh, whether they're white or whether they're black. Okay. Okay. So we um, looked at the census and then you were talking about court documents. Right. So where do you locate these court documents? Well, oftentimes they're still with the county clerk. Um, sometimes they're at the state archives. In this case, uh, these documents were at the New Jersey State Archives. And so you, you uh, obtain copies of that. And then, of course, when it moves to the Supreme Court, uh, the New Jersey State Archives has microfilmed all of its Supreme Court case files. And so I was able to print this uh, document out from the, that microfilm from the Supreme Court. So was this when he was caught? This, uh, this would have been uh, when he was freed. Okay. Yeah. So tell us about this Supreme Court case. Well, the Supreme Court case was heard by uh, Josiah uh, Hornblower, who was the uh, who was the chief justice. And while he did not publish his findings, he only summarized them in the court proceedings. Um, you know, he found uh, uh, that uh, color alone was not a determinant as to whether somebody was slave or free, um, and that he also. Uh, uh, you know, he set he set Alexander free. Um, uh, it was a it was a wonderful court case. Um, and then uh, in the New York Evening Post in the 1850s, after the passage of the 1850 Federal Fugitive Slave Act, 
published a hornblower's decision um, and it became a great tool to be used by those uh, abolition attorneys looking to free other uh, captured fugitives. So there it is. That, that's his findings in a nutshell. That the color was no longer presumptive evidence of slavery in New Jersey. Yep. And that, that address at the bottom um, is where you can find that published pamphlet of, the, uh, of his opinion. So they set, they then set him free. They set him free and his friends advised him not to remain in Jersey as much as he wanted to, because he had established his life here. Uh, but he fled to Canada. Um, and on one day, uh, mostly by walking, he traveled almost 200 miles to get well up into New York state. Meanwhile, friends had raised enough money that his friends being Quakers had raised enough money to send along his wife and children. Um, and, uh, you know, they finally reached Alexander when he was convalescing from his trip. And, uh, he, uh, yeah. And I think that that arduous trip to Canada is what, uh, put him in an early grave. Uh, but when it, while he was in Canada, he became a deacon and then an elder and then a bishop of the AME church of Canada. Oh, so he, so he was a bishop in an AME church in Canada. Right. At St. Catherine's right over across the uh, across the uh, uh, from Niagara Falls in the Canadian side. So when he originally ran away, did he run away with his family or was he his solo? No, he married while he was here in New Jersey. So he was by himself. It's those Jersey um, girls got to him, huh? That's right. That's right. <laughs> um, when he ran away, he said, uh, I know I was not ill treated by my master. He said, I, 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 but, but then they, you see that quote that he had, where what freedom was to him, that if he thought of anything beneficial to himself, that he should have the liberty to do it. And that's why he ran away, because he, that was in, a, in a, his innate sense of freedom. Wow, that's pretty tight. That's pretty tight, because, you know, we think people are running away from torture and mistreatment, you know, about to be sold away, but he just wanted to have freedom to of mind, peace of right. mind, yeah. to be able to do what he felt yeah. was right for him and his Yeah, family. which I think uh, points well to his um, intellectual capacity. He, uh, uh, you know, he probably very much in the same vein as W.E.B. Du Bois in wanting to develop the intellectual mind. Too bad he died so soon. Yeah. That is a shame. <laughs> This is one that I don't even know, like where you got this from, this friends, the friend. Is this a newsletter? It was a it was a journal or newspaper that came out. And of course, this uh, described his case on the front page. This is uh, uh, and it's six months, which tells you the friend means the Quakers mm -hmm. because they never used the, uh, the the names of the days or months because they felt they were pagan. So it's seventh day, six months. 11 1836 so um and and so you know the the religious society of friends being very strong in the abolitionist area uh they published this article about uh, isaac bags and about alexander hemsley and uh about the case that was tried and so it's a it's a great article are these online did they put yes, the were they published um regular they um they're available online you said Yes, they are available online. It may be by subscription. I think that one might have come from accessiblearchives.org. Oh, great spot. Accessible yeah. Archives. They yeah. also have AME, the Christian Yeah, Recorder they have the Christian there. Recorder. They have probably the largest collection of African-American newspapers online or abolitionist newspapers. Accessible Archives. That's where I found out that snitches got stitches in New Jersey from yeah. the Accessible Archives. <laughs> They actually wanted to basically, they almost hung somebody who came to Lawnside, currently Snow Hill. That's the cops right. had to pull yeah, them off. Right. Oh, they, they beat him to a pulp. <laughs> I have that story. It's a great story. So, and step five, six is really to just document your findings. Right. So, Paul, when doing this research, are there any other tips that you would like to, to give on researching the Underground Railroad or... Um, but 
here in New Jersey, South Jersey, you have to learn the roots. Um, some of that root material comes from Thomas Clement Oliver in uh, Wilbur Seifert's book um, about the about the Underground Railroad. And of course, you can learn it from William Stills, the Underground Railroad, who describes roots. Um, uh, of course, his parents first escaped to Springtown down in uh, down near Greenwich in Cumberland County. So there's a uh, there's a lot of uh, interesting history. And also you want to, I would say, and you taught me this as well, is Seabird isn't the, you know, it. You have to go right. deeper. And one thing that I noticed about um, Seabird and his map is that it doesn't show all of the roots within a state. No, not so at all. you want to, his is more of a nas national version. Yeah of the underground railroad route so you definitely want to get books that are local to your state yes. right yeah exactly because otherwise uh, it's going to be hard to pick it up and uh because the communities the enclaves played such an important role and particularly if the community contained an ame church the ame church was critical for operations of the underground railroad um and um uh, and, uh, and 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 these communities were as well because uh, the fugitive could just blend in with the populace um, and then move on to the next site, uh, next location as they traveled north. So you want to look at the Quakers, the AME Church. I believe there's a couple other religions that were pretty much, pretty strong, but the Quakers, the AME Church were probably, yeah. you know, numbered the top ones. Would you right. agree? I agree. I agree. Absolutely. All right, let's go through the steps. That was great, Paul. Thank you. His long twisted road to freedom, Alexander Hemsley. So step one is you want to read the slave narratives. Um, look for your person. Look for stories about the area. Step two, look for place names in that um, slave narrative. Step three, learn about the Black enclaves because this is where, as Paul said, they could they could move about more freely. Step four, search census records. Step five, locate court documents. And step six, document your findings. Paul, that was great. And um, I'm so glad that the Enclave book is coming along. I cannot wait to, um, to have it. Um, let's bring back our buddies. Let's add to the stream. Where's Michael at? Michael's down there. Why are you down there, Michael? There we are. Guys, how you doing? We don't have a question of the day. This would be a perfect time to have a question of the day. So you want a question of the day? Huh? Yeah. Okay. What's, what's each of our furthest back in time documented ancestor? What date? Ooh, who's going first? Well, since I created it, I might as well say. Fifteen. And, well, well, you know these these Helmershausen folks that I just uncovered are giving it a run for the money, but the absolute earliest is from the town of Langensabalt in Hesse, my Kirchner family, and there's a date fourteen ninety five. What? Oh my gosh. And because you're such a prominent genealogist, I'm not going to call your research false because usually they say when somebody says 14, anything, you go, no. So, Michael, what's yours? Oh, he's, he's looking. He's looking. He's tabulating it. <laughs> I would say mine is, um, I would say right now, the oldest estate um inventory which was 1855. Okay. It's not shabby, but I need to do better. <laughs> As cousin Russ told me. Michael or Paul, you have any old, old what's how far you go back? Well, uh for me, because of my research, um the oldest member of the Still family I have found is Delilah Still, who was born in 1752. Wow. And how was Delilah related to William? She's not. Oh, okay. William, William, William's father and mother's uh, original surname was Steele. Steele. S-T-E-E-L. And they grafted themselves into the local Steele family to hide their identity. 
And so is this the is this the is this the Guinea Prince yes. still? This okay. is the Guinea Prince. And what was that year again? 1752, which makes her probably either the uh, probably the great granddaughter of the Guinea Prince. Okay. Okay. Fantastic. Michael, can you hear me? I can hear you now. I had a slight issue. I'm sorry. That's okay. Did you hear the the question of the day, the oldest document? The oldest document that I've got, I uh, it's Church records from the 1550s, and then I would say things from Massachusetts shortly after the uh, Pilgrims landed. All right. I saw that boat. Did you guys go see the Mayf at that boat? I guess it's a ship. The Mayflower up in uh, in the Boston area. Did you guys go on to it? You never went to and take some pictures? Oh, man. It's really cool looking. It's really kitschy, but it's cool. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you so much for being Thanks. here today. I appreciate your time. Thank you for watching. And Denise, we're going to talk about those narrow boats. All right, everyone, have a great day. Bye. Stay on hold. Thanks, guys.